All right. Hi. Hello to everyone in person on the live stream. And a special hello to everyone in the future watching this on recording. I hope we won against the robot uprising, or I respect our robot overlords. One way or the other, hopefully we're covered. Um, welcome to Beyond Discourse Dumpster Fires, Strategies and Tools for Better Online Civil Space. My name is Jonathan Bellack, and I am the director of the Applied Social Media Lab here at Harvard's Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society. I'll also be your host for today. <laughs> Good energy in the room. Thank you. Um, the Berkman Klein Center has a 25-year history of bringing together some of the sharpest, most thoughtful people from around the globe to reveal and tackle the biggest challenges presented by the internet. By joining today's event, you've counted yourself among that number, and I thank you for making the time to be with us today. I also want to thank right up front everyone who helped make this event possible, our esteemed guests and speakers, the board and staff of the Berkman Klein Center, and of course, Harvard Law School and Harvard University. To frame the afternoon, I want to introduce you to the Applied Social Media Lab, share a few thoughts of my own about why discourse dumpster fires are so quick to spark and hard to extinguish, and hopefully persuade you that our lab is a worthwhile effort to create viable alternatives. After that, I'll turn you over to the tender cares of the day's speakers. First, just a note about myself and why I'm doing this. My own internet journey started when I discovered Usenet as an undergraduate on the Yale College campus in 1990 and continued through the dot-com boom and crash and a product management career in online advertising and counter-abuse technology at DoubleClick and Google. Uh, on that online advertising part, I'm really sorry, and I'll try to do better next time. <laughs> sorry about that. Um, on to the Applied Social Media Lab. We are a team of industry-trained technologists working within academia to build social media solutions in the public interest. We're an interdisciplinary effort demonstrating and driving change through working code. The lab has two goals. First, experimentation in search of one or more breakthrough innovations that will change the future and over the long term of social media for the better. Second, we are working to build a durable community of practice so that technical and academic leaders who share this mission can support each other and collaborate long into the future. So I hope for all of you, this is not the only time I'll get to speak with you, that this is the beginning of a longer relationship and a bigger community. So what do I mean when I say we're building social media solutions in the public interest? At the lab, we define social media broadly as any system that enables human connection and exchange online. Conventional platforms like Facebook are only a small part of the story. Social media today, of course, includes video creator platforms like YouTube, TikTok, and Twitch, but also semi-private communities like WhatsApp groups and Discord servers, Discord servers, and even app and gaming features like reviews in Google Maps and online chat in Minecraft and Roblox. Social media also increasingly offers a home for the work of academia. It's a digital home for teaching and learning. I believe ultimately it's better to be expansive than precise to capture this diversity of online experiences. As to the public interest, we believe the public interest is best served when social media fosters healthy and thriving human interactions. Now we do recognize that just like all conceptions of the public interest, healthy and thriving legitimately can mean different things to different people. We're not trying to change or standardize human nature against one model. I do believe that social media has a responsibility to treat people with a baseline level of dignity and to make it as easy as possible for people to be their best selves online. When it works, social media is life-changing. It can foster human connections, give marginalized people access to supportive communities, and make all of us more aware of what is happening in the wider world. I've experienced the best of social media in my own life. I met my wife through an online dating service, and during the pandemic, my two sons' friendships and social lives were saved by chat in online video games and the Roll20 platform for playing Dungeons and Dragons with people remotely. Shout out to my Dungeons and Dragons friends. Let's talk later. All right, I like that guy. Um, so the problem is, it's great when it works, but too often social media feels life-changing in the worst possible way. 
It can encourage arguments, <clears throat> provide a home for organized hate and harassment, and make us all more entrenched in unexamined beliefs. Online strife is even spilling out into real world conflict. In other words, a discourse dumpster fire. Now, the tech companies hosting these dump fires, dumpster fires aren't happy with this, of course. They've made huge investments to fight abuse and reduce harms. From my own years at Google, I can personally attest that these are some of the most dedicated and mission-driven people you will ever meet. These teams are full of people who work tirelessly to protect the vulnerable and try to make the internet a slightly less terrible place. But despite all this effort, these problems persist and they seem to be even getting worse. I don't believe this is a problem of willingness. It's not a problem of competency. I believe, and I'm hopefully will persuade a few of you of this, that it's a problem of practice. Too many social media platforms are trying to solve these problems with the same narrow approach that I don't think works. And I refer to this as promote and police. And I want to tell you a little bit about what I mean by that. Promote and police starts when, in search of growth and revenue, platforms standardize what you say, what you think, what you create online into small, separate, measurable units called content that can be processed as efficiently and automatically as possible. Now, this leaves very little room for context or nuance. A long stream of thought, novel vernacular created by a specific subcommunity, and complex interactions between groups of people have to be jettisoned if they interfere with the scale required for superior financial performance. Once you've got all these little units of content, Platform teams write algorithms and increasingly turn to artificial intelligence to identify and promote what they consider to be good content. Now, because these systems are operated by businesses, good is usually defined as engagement, which means whatever will get you to use the platform more and advertisers to pay more money to try to reach you. Algorithmic promotion in a profit-driven environment has an unavoidable bias towards the sensational and the inflammatory because that's what drives more usage. Now the platforms know this, this isn't a surprise, and they do try to limit the system's tendency to drive engagement at all costs. And that brings us to the police. Prat platforms write a competing set of algorithms to try to identify the bad content that's in there with all of the good stuff they're trying to promote and try to keep it away from you. Maybe they take it out of the promotion system. Maybe they take it off the platform entirely. Now, the problem here is that trying to police human behavior at scale, mostly with computers, is not a good way to encourage human thriving. When an AI tells you that your last comment broke the rules, or worse, that the harassment you reported was actually A-OK, -okay. the real message conveyed is that the platform doesn't trust you. They trust the machine more than the human. And this can even lead to injustice when innocent people are cut off from their accounts entirely because the algorithm said so and there's a very limited right to appeal because the platforms don't have the time or the money to let everybody appeal what the computers are doing. Platforms do employ people to work on this, tens of thousands of people, and they're reviewing cases, but too often, they're instructed to simply double check the machines for defects. Hey, did the algorithm spit out the right answer? It's like they're reviewing parts on an assembly line for defects, not to make a humane judgment about what's really going on or to seek more context or look for the nuance. This battle is never won because humans in aggregate are almost infinitely resourceful, especially when they feel like they're not trusted. So somebody's always finding a novel way to break the rules and get around the machines. The default platform response to this is to say, hey, we did it wrong. We need to close the loophole. We need to patch the vulnerability. We need to add even more oversight. And that leads to a surveillance nightmare. Everything you say or do online today is run through multiple systems constantly looking for violations and with a focus on did you do something wrong, did somebody do something wrong, was a rule broken, even slightly, even possibly. Artificial intelligence promises to supercharge this arms race even more by making it so much easier to create bad stuff and add more oversight. So you get hostile and policing AIs 
one-upping each other forever, we're gonna swamp the internet with more junk and more rules to some bad outcome. And that's the issue. When a social media platform removes context, rewards sensationalism, and replaces trust with surveillance, that's a recipe for bringing out the worst of human nature. And uh, credit to Jonathan Zittrain for this line, if you fill the dumpster with mattresses soaked in kerosene, you're going to get a dumpster fire. If you didn't want me to mention you, I apologize, but it's a good line. Oh, there you go. <laughs> um, so I want to pause here to just be clear again, I'm not blaming the companies, I'm not blaming the employees, and I'm not trying to say that anybody created this problem on purpose or took some idealized perfect world of the pre-computer past and made it terrible. Going back to this question of human nature, the platforms are simply competing to give people what they indicate they want with their choices. There was a great book about uh, the fast food industry in 2001 called Fast Food Nation, written by a guy named Eric Schlosser. And he writes, quote, the executives who run the fast food industry are not bad men. They are businessmen. They will sell whatever sells at a profit. That's what we're looking at here. The people running social media are not bad people. They're competing in a marketplace to try to get more people using their stuff and more advertisers paying to reach you. And you end up with a dumpster fire. And this brings me to my proposal to hopefully move a little bit beyond this dumpster fire world we're living in. I believe we can do better if social media in the public interest becomes more open to variety. People need more options about how to communicate and more freedom to choose where to communicate so that they at least have the possibility of breaking out of this promote and police cycle in search of healthier experiences. And healthier experiences are out there, and there are thousands and millions if you look at the real world. Communities give birth to associations all the time with rules and structures that are novel, book clubs, knitting circles, support groups, Dungeons and Dragons parties. Academia is a rich vein of communication modes, lectures, seminars, symposia, office hours, student clubs, and more. And government adds to the choices as well. Town halls, school board meetings, caucuses, debates, legislatures, courts, juries. These options go on and on. And you can't reduce all of this rich human dialogue to variations of a Facebook group. And so today's online world should support a lot more experimentation and a lot of different ways to communicate, but it's too hard today because the largest platforms have presented us with hard bundles of rules and features that we cannot modify or opt out of in any meaningful way. If we don't like that hard bundle, our only option is to go try another platform, but transferring our friends and history is either difficult or completely impossible. And this lock-in makes it too hard for newer and healthier modes of human interaction to survive and grow, which creates the false impression that people prefer this as a status quo. Now, the availability of more options and an easier time changing between them won't revolutionize the world in and of itself, but it can make a difference. In the 20 years since the publication of Fast Food Nation, American eating habits have improved, modestly but measurably. As another example, mobile phone number portability, which is also only about 20 years old in the US, has led to more competition and lower prices for consumers in many countries around the world. When I try to explain to my teenage son that once upon a time, you couldn't take your phone number with you from Verizon to AT&T, and you didn't have choices like Boost Mobile if you really like Ryan Reynolds, which he does, he doesn't believe me. And so my hope is that 20 years from now, having your own friends and interests permanently locked into one company's servers forever will seem like just as much as a of a bad fairy tale. So today's program is the Applied Social Media Lab's first contribution towards expanding our ideas of what kind of healthy discourse should be available online. I hope that after today, you'll be convinced to demand more options and more flexibility in your own online life. So let's quickly go through the agenda here. Guzo, can you pop me one ahead? There we go. Um, so next up, Jonathan Zittrain is gonna host a panel with Deb Roy, Dana Boyd, and Gordon Pennycook to discuss how we can protect civil discourse in this, in this age of fracture. 
Then after a short break, Professor Charles Nesson and product manager Laura Schul will share NimSpace, a tool to open your mind to the possibilities of online discourse by enabling trusted small groups to communicate pseudonymously on difficult topics. Finally, Professor Larry Lessig and product manager Sam Shireman will introduce the lab's new video platform for online deliberations, which we will be making available to organizations in beta in coming months. I hope you'll find this something that you might want to try out in your own community. Um, for those of you in person, we are going to have a reception afterwards so we can continue the discussion. Now, I'm acutely aware after inflicting four pages of text on you that opening keynotes are the medicine that you have to take before the banquet gets underway. So without any further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Jonathan Zittrain and our panelists to the stage. Thank you very much. <laughs>